Cafe Cabaret. This is The Wrong Hero, and um, today's presentation is entitled Revenge Farce. And uh, of course we are continuing our, so far, 10 week long series on the presidential elections of 1996 in general and on politics in particular. But before we proceed, I would like to devote a certain portion of this particular program to a discussion of the phrase, the turn of the screw. This is the scholarly portion of our programming, which enables us to meet the FCC dicta for offering entertaining and yet informative programming in the public interest. And so, for the next five minutes, my public interest announcement. A quotation search of the Oxford English Dictionary, second edition, gives the earliest recorded use of the phrase, turn of the screw, in a context pertaining to the torture of slaves in 1796, cited by George Walpole, cited in B. Edwards. The next major citation of the phrase, the turn of the screw, is in Charles Dickens' Bleak House and appears as a chapter heading, A Turn of the Screw. The most famous use of this phrase comes from the title of a novella by Henry James, The Turn of the Screw, published in 1898. Before discussing the use of this term in James, I would like to mention a few of the more interesting facets of this expression. First of all, screw, when used as a verb, can actually mean to turn. The Indo-European root of the word screw, cited in the third edition of the American Heritage Dictionary, is scare, also care, to cut. Turn is derived from tear, to rub, turn, twist, drill, bore, and I certainly hope I'm not boring you. Uh, secondly, in the Morris Dictionary, a screw means not only a prison guard or turnkey, but also refers to the key itself, which is used to lock the jail door. A turnkey's function is to turn the screw. Another theory is that screw refers to thumb screws used by jailers in ancient times to torture prisoners into confessing. The second interpretation is also cited in the Oxford English Dictionary. Finally, in Craigie and Holbert's A Dictionary of American English, the principal meaning is cited under to put the screws on or variants, put pressure on or force payment of a debt. The latter sense is probably the one which Dickens utilizes in Bleak House in 1853. Craigie and Holbert cite is circa 1860. The OED cites Bartlett's Dictionary of Americanisms from 1859 for the same shade of meaning, to put the screws on, to put pressure upon, or force payment of a debt. In his correspondence to F.W.H. Myers of 1219-1898, Henry James refers to his novella as a very mechanical matter. In his preface he calls it a piece of ingenuity of cold artistic calculation. As a matter of fact, the entire story of the turn of the screw is an elaborate etymological puzzle. Even those who have not read the story might be interested to know that virtually every definition of the word screw, and there are at least 40 of them, is referred to in the body of the text at least once. Furthermore, I was surprised to learn that William Henry James even seems to derive his very technique for creating suspense from these multiple meanings of the word screw. I will enumerate my example. Number one, to increase the tension or, or pitch of a musical string, to stretch tight by turning a screw. Number two, to stretch strain, force the meaning of words. 
Number three, to adjust an instrument by turning. Number four, to force or draw out information, a secret, the truth, etc., from a person by moral pressure, to draw out by close questioning, to force the admission of. Number five, to examine rigorously. Number six, to produce, attain, or elicit with an effort. Number seven, to work a screw or something fashioned as a screw by turning. Number eight, to insert or fix one thing in, into, on, to, or upon another or two things together by a turning or twisting movement. Number nine, to implant firmly a notion by means of gradual insinuation, to insinuate oneself by degrees into a person's favor. Number 10, to worm one's way into. Number 11, to move in a twisting direction. Number 12, to twist, contort the features, to twist round in order to look at something. Number 13, to break into a house by means of a screw or skeleton key. Number 14, an apparatus for applying pressure or strain. Number 15, a means of pressure or coercion. Number 16, something having a spiral course or form. In the independent of January 5th, 1899, the turn of the screw is called the most hopelessly evil story that we have ever read in any literature, ancient or modern. Oliver Elton, in 1907, called it one of the hideous stories of our language. In this light, it is interesting to note that one of the meanings of screw, first cited in the OED in 1934, is to pervert, upset, disturb mentally. It may well be that part of this story's disturbing resonance has something to do with the hidden layers of meaning buried, not only in the phrase which forms the title, but in the repeated subliminal evocations of the title phrase within the body of the story itself. So, now that we've gotten that out of the way, <coughs> let's proceed. My fondest wish is that if you smoke marijuana today, your fingernails would turn green the next day. Now, I didn't say it. H. Ross Perot said it in the San Francisco Chronicle of June 18, 1992, cited in the Drug Policy Letter of Fall 1996. As Jacob Selim puts it, a fact-resistant Manichaean worldview dominates media coverage of smoking, whether he means smoking marijuana or tobacco or whatever. I think perhaps that is, in fact, so. Yes. Ah. Say. Ah. Drug, drug use and abuse is a ubiquitous social phenomenon that ought to be treated as a public health matter, not a war. Nor should those who have used narcotics be forever banned from public service, or for that matter, from useful employment. Well, what a refreshing change of pace. And here, <coughs> I didn't apply to the CIA because I thought they'd nail me. Oh, man. Well, anyway. Uh, uh, I'm so sleepy. Mm, I want to go to bed now. As Helen Keller put it, knowledge is happiness. And as Pam Danzinger put it, baby boomers don't mind blowing $500 for something that expresses their alter ego, the person they wish they could be. Uh, and, uh, she wouldn't happen to be referring to this video camera, I don't think, but maybe so. We're getting off the subject. This is supposed to be about a revenge farce. So now that we're about the, at the midway point, let me read an amusing anecdote. It is from the New Yorker of July 7th. According to DSM-4, narcissistic personality disorder constitutes at least five of the following symptoms. One, 
a grandiose sense of self-importance. Number two, a preoccupation with fantasies of unlimited success, power, and brilliance. Number three, believing oneself to be special or understood only by the other special or high status people. Certainly not by the common uh, hoi polloi. Number four, requiring excessive admiration. Number five, a sense of entitlement where one assumes that one's requests should be automatically met or one should get special privileges. Number six, the tendency to be exploitative personally, to use other people to achieve your own ends. Number seven, to be lacking in empathy, not really being able to feel the way other people feel, or at least understand what their emotional reaction might involve. <coughs> Number eight, envy, often feeling envious of others. Number nine, being perceived by others as arrogant or haughty. And this was at the John Hinckley hearing, and when the judge, when the lawyer had finished reading off this list of symptoms of narcissistic personality disorder, someone in the stands whispered, sounds like everybody in Washington, D.C., cited by Mimi Schwartz in the uh, talk of the town section. <coughs> <coughs> So, back to the script. <laughs> yes, yes. Herbert Hoover's authorized break-in of the Democratic Party headquarters, and his eighth cousin once removed Richard M. Nixon, 42 years later. Intelligence services have faithfully carried out even unethical or illegal orders. Duh. Oh, really? Fealty of the intelligence services to the dictates of the American presidents, Chris Andrews. Gee, this is called revenge farce. The reason being, um, Hamlet, where did I get that from? Well, I'm not a left field. Hamlet, what's that have to do with politics? Uh, well, Hamlet um, was originally adapted from a revenge tragedy. And, uh, you know, the Hamlet scholars will give you all the, all the lowdown, all the proof. Some, some things to do with an earlier prototypical version of Hamlet, written by another playwright, which Shakespeare heavily adapted. I think that Hamlet may have been written as early as uh, 1596. And the 1604 or 1601 versions that we... Um, have extant are merely refinements of an earlier prototypical Ur Hamlet. Uh, however, some radical critics have encouraged us to look at Hamlet as a farce. Hence the title of this political presentation, Revenge Farce. And a great many of Shakespeare's plays were, of course, highly political. I mean, Othello, or Coriolanus, or Macbeth. But, in some respects, the longest is perhaps the most political of all, and that is King Lear. Ha, ha, told you. Um, Hamlet is one of the most political of plays um, in the output of a playwright who did not shy away from an intelligent ratiocination of political events and matters. So I call this revenge farce in honor of William Shakespeare, my kinsman. And uh, of course, that makes us the two noble kinsmen. Hey, me and Willie. And uh, who's that little midget man? Um, you know the guy. The one that's all in all the commercials which humiliates Shakespeare. Well, anyway, uh, him too, I guess. 
Gary Coleman. Poor guy. To think that he gets a walk on with Chase for only to be whacked away with a backhanded slap. I was going to say something incredibly important here, but now I forgot. Oh yeah! Why doesn't somebody rewrite Hamlet from the point of view of Ophelia? I mean, it's already been done, right? With uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead by Tom Stoppard. But uh, why doesn't somebody do this for Ophelia? Maybe there could even be like some a musical. You know, with uh, with snappy theme music by big name rock and roll and uh, pop music um, artists such as Paul Simon, who could write Ophelia, you're breaking my heart, you're shaking my confidence daily. You know, in a sort of goofy country and western mode. Oh, I feel you. I'm down on my knees. I'm begging you, please, to come home. Oh, you come home. <laughs> well, that's beginning to sound more like Walt Disney's version of Hamlet. Hey! Ding! Oh, no. The Lion King. It's already been done. All right. It's really too bad. Yeah, that's... See, that, that just... Isn't that just the way... Lion King was how many films ago in this cycle? Uh, let's see, number 35, number 35. That was number 32. So his 32nd film, he finally gets around to doing a wishy-washy rehash of Hamlet. Of course, it was said to be the first original script of a Disney animated feature. Of course, the first original script for a full-length animated feature goes to the Fleischer Brothers, and Mr. Bug goes to town, also known as Hoppity goes to town, the Fleischer Brothers' second and last full-length animated feature. That was a real bomb, I can tell you that. I mean, it wasn't such a bad, I mean, as feature-length animation goes, it was certainly very competently executed. I mean, there was no real story. I mean, what can I say? I don't know. I, I, yeah, I, like, it was like the late Jimmy Stewart was like portrayed as a grasshopper. You know, one of these Bigfoot aw shucks types whose every third gesture is a blush. You know, uh, the archetypal American Midwestern hick cum force of goodness. And uh, it was a pretty insipid story. Let's just leave it at that. Having said that, let us proceed. We must move on. We're not getting very far. So, um, the military industrial complex, yeah. It is all due to the post-World War II problem of militarization. If it's true that generals are always fighting the last war, instead of the one that they're currently fighting, then after World War II, the lesson that was obviously drawn by our country's defense forces was that of we were unprepared for 1939 and Hitler's invasion of Poland. Let us never be unprepared in just this way ever again. So let us build a garrison state which kept in a state of constant alertness will in fact inevitably because of the very nature of a new tool, be used for every possible application. Diplomacy? Faw! Let us have a Cold War with the Soviets, lasting over 40 years. Now, here's a really interesting fact. One that they don't talk about much in the history books, but one which I recently uncovered due to my own rather extensive historical researches. In 1905, there was a treaty made by then Vice President Taft, former governor of the Philippines. I don't recall the exact name, but what it had to do with was it was a treaty made between the United States and Japan. And 
the deal was this. In return for not invading the Philippines, the, Japan, the Japanese can do whatever they want with Korea. Now this was in 1905. Is it any wonder that 45 years later, the pot boils over? People ask, well, what are we to Korea or Korea to we? Well, we've, been, we've had our fingers in Korea ever since the turn of the century, apparently. So that's just uh, FYI for your information. Now, um, there'll be more on this particular treaty once I've uncovered more information about it. I may, in fact, be doing that this very day at my job over at Providence College, where one of my duties is to assist a professor or a faculty member in uh, doing historical research. Basically, he's putting out a CD-ROM of important American historical documents, but he has to get all of his sources from non-electronic places. Like, it has to be hard copy. It can't, you can't just get someone else's CD-ROM and copy it. So we're, we have to hunt down all this obscure, all these obscure documents that Henry Cottager Steele <coughs> had uh, once hunted down. I was very successful in finding one of these documents. It was uh, Harry Truman's uh, union busting speech. Uh, I believe it was May 25th, 1947. The railroads went on strike. So Truman promptly nationalized the railroads and put soldiers in charge of it. And of course, everybody screamed bloody murder. Well, not everybody, mind you. But, uh, well, predictably, the conservatives say, oh, Truman's infring infringing on, uh, on our rights as individuals. And of course, the unions are like ape shit over this. And the opinion journals like New Republic chime in with their uh, two cents that, to the extent that, oh, this is the worst, this is the worst union busting activity in the history of the American Republic, blah, blah, blah. But in retrospect, Harry Truman had the grit and the gumption to do what had to be done. It, and of course, he was continuing a rather wrong-headed policy instituted some 45 years previous in Korea. What got me off on this enormous tangent was, of course, the military-industrial complex, which Harry Truman had a pretty big hand in forming. Now, at the end of World War II, of course, people say, oh, we could have wiped out the Soviet Union. We would have had that problem, blah, blah, blah. Well, then it would have been us against the world. We would have been no better than the Nazis, who tried to do, incidentally, the very same thing. Um, so obviously, that wasn't really an, an option. We could get away with dropping nukes on Japan, but I don't think we could have gotten away with uh, dropping nukes on Europeans, if you get my drift. Fire bombs, yes. Nukes, that's just a little too far, okay? So, anyway, mm, I, I saw the movie Nixon by Oliver Stone recently. And, uh, well, considering it was over three hours long, and considering that the outtakes were far more entertaining than the actual film, and, you know, you really did yourself a disservice if you saw it in its first run, because the video cassette version has wonderful, wonderful outtakes. But in it, of course, uh, Oliver Stone doesn't shy away from controversy. It is as mother's milk to him. In the outtakes, he talks about the role of the CIA and their fealty to presidents and their ability to blackmail presidents into getting larger appropriations. As a matter of fact, the, um, the Long Kiss Goodnight had a very similar plot of a CIA chief attempting to shake down a president of the United States. However, of course, uh, Stone's film only had that in the outtakes, and it was a major plot thread of The Long Kiss Goodnight. A ridiculously implausible action flick, but one with a strong central feminine hero 
even though, of course, she has a mannish and a feminine side. Uh, of all the stereotyped hackneyed uh, dichotomies, in one identity, she's a school teacher, and in the other, she's a contract CIA assassin. It's sort of like um, True Lies, right, without Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, it's uh, and replaced by a black private eye, who himself is sort of like Easy Rollins uh, out of that... Uh, I can't keep all these things straight. But, you know, they don't really make movies anymore. What they do is they, uh, they come up with menu options one from column A, two from column B. Take the bloodthirsty CIA assassin from True Lies, make him into a her, take the black private eye from the Easy Rollins detective series, make him her reluctant sidekick, in much the same way that Die Hard with a Vengeance had a reluctant black sidekick. What is this with this, this Huckleberry Finn crap anyway? Christ, can we, can we think of any new archetypes just for once, can't the black guy be the plausible hero of a mainstream film not intended specifically for the black audience with a reluctant white man as his partner? No. Well, let's see, there's probably been one like that, right? But, um, because, you know, even, even the most hackneyed formulas get tweaked endlessly. But what was I getting at? Yeah, why doesn't somebody do a movie about the military-industrial complex, huh? <coughs> because I don't think our masters would appreciate that. I mean, I hear and I obey. Um, so, I'm getting tangled up in this morass of the military industrial complex, which Eisenhower presciently warned against in his farewell address of eight, 1961. Of course, uh, old Abe Lincoln knew quite a bit about the MIC. Of course, back then it wasn't that. It was uh, just Abe and a bunch of foot-dragon generals. Why did Abraham Lincoln's Union Force generals drag their heels? Because they wanted to prolong the agony. I mean, if not consciously, at least subconsciously, it's like, oh, we don't want this war to be over right away. Let's let it drag out for a while and see what develops. Uh, McClellan, what a clown. What a jerk. I wouldn't have voted for him. See, I like to think that I like to flatter myself that I would have been smart enough to see through these bogus so-called would-be heroes. Classic East Coast thinking, you know. The, what, everybody, what everybody in the heartland believes must be wrong. Therefore, I will believe the opposite. Oliver North is not a hero. Actually, I am proud of myself. See, I wasn't susceptible to his glib pleas because I wasn't a big television watcher, so I didn't see his. Ernest gap tooth performance before the Senate, and I knew, I just knew that Oliver North was no, up to no good, that Doug Flutie would be a flash in the pan, that Mike Tyson was little more than a rampaging beast, okay, just to get a more contemporary reference in there. Uh, anyway, yeah, I'm really dithering here. It's because, uh... Boom. Well, basically because I'm out of campaign material. We're in the campaign post-mortem stuff. Such as Newsweek's recaps, which are uh, really quite wonderful. Now, I don't often have cause to refer directly to these sources for my information. They are multiferous. I will assure you that I read over 40 journals every month, and um, that is 40 weekly journals, which means, of course, 160 journals. Can I really read that many? No, nah, I couldn't read that many. Let's see. Let me give a rundown, brief rundown. Ooh, well, The Economist. Say I put that one first, even though it's the one I really only read in the most superficial and, superficial and cursory way. Um, Economist, Time, Newsweek, U.S. News and World Report, Nation, New Republic, Weekly Standard, um, New Yorker. Did I already say the New Yorker? Um, duh, that's eight. Uh, um, those are those are mostly weekly. National Review, which is bi-weekly. 
um, 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 in these times, which is bi-weekly. Um, and then, of course, running the gamut from A to B, uh, American Spectator, American Demographics, American Prospect, um, that other American one, whatever the hell it's called, American something or other, uh, the American Journalism Review, the Columbia Journalism Review, the Washington Monthly, um, the blah, gee, am I missing any? The Advocate, um, just for the hell of it. And it's about 13, isn't it? Or is that 18? It must be 18. I can't remember. And, well, let's see, 18 out of 40 ain't bad. And there's a whole bunch of others, you know, the monthlies, like um, the, <laughs> yeah, let's see, American Spectator, Utney Reader, um, and all the ones in between, you know, the monthly ones. Oh, Harper's, The Atlantic, uh, and so on and forth. The Limbo Letter, Extra. Um, sometimes I look at the Far Eastern Economic Review or Asia Week, although, to be sure, I don't really have the time to read everything cover to cover. And in fact, let me assure you that I do not. Um, it's just not enough time in all the world. Uh, I'd love to read every single one of these damn things. The Progressive, um, well I do read that, actually. Even though the Kennedy School Government Library does not get it, and I have to go elsewhere for it, something which annoys me to no end. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I, I plow through about 30 of these things a month. Some of them weekly, some of them monthly. So, you know, I, anyway, Newsweek has this section called Conventional Wisdom Watch. And in their December 30th issue of 1996, they refer to Bill Clinton as <coughs> synthesizer-in-chief Kemp as flat-footed softy sabotages Dole and says Mars, new movie, organic stuff on rock, give new life to Ross Perot's home planet. So, uh, 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 hmm. In any event, We're getting to the end of 1996, our coverage of the events of the year. There's a great headline in the Boston Globe of December 28, 1996. Laughing gunman kills one, wounds two, San Francisco. Police touched yesterday for a man who walked into a McDonald's in Northern California and while laughing, opened fire with a revolver, killing a female employee, injuring two others, female. Actually, it was in uh, Vallejo, 25 miles northeast of San Francisco. This was reported by Reuters. So, anyway, in the nation of January 6, 1997, we're finally getting into 1997 here, it is said, the cities are hurting badly and the nation will pay the consequences for many years. We can be caught flat-footed by the violent outbursts, which will stem from the anger in the cities, which increasing numbers of local leaders feel is inevitable. Cisneros proposed to increase public investment, create more community development banks, reclaim contaminated urban land, 40% of Cleveland, connect inner-city residents to jobs outside their community, turn public housing into wired campuses with computer connections. Okay, let's do that. I wouldn't mind. How are they going to download from a CD-ROM, though? I mean, how are they going to download to a remote? Are they going to all have their own printers, too? Do they get Windows 95, or do they have to get one of the non-Pentium chip? 486s or 386s instead. See, I can, I, can, I can yak this lingo with the best of them. In fact, you know, the internet was founded as a computer thang. In fact, computers were developed during World War II 
Of course, they had uh, appeared in crude prototypical form as early as Henry Babbage's adding machines. But uh, uh, they were used to calculate the trajectory of missiles. After World War II, they were developed. Um, the Rand Corporation thought, well, gee, what if we have a nuclear war and all the computers are linked indissolubly? That will knock out all the computers. <coughs> Let's decentralize the computer system. And so they had Milnet and ARPANET. Um, which eventually split off from each other. ARPANET became the internet. For a while they had gophers, but they got rid of them. Now they have search engines and uh, Setch. And um, so now you can pretty much uh, go to the internet, get on the World Wide Web, a recent innovation incidentally, and uh, type in your last name. See if there's anything that pops up. Who knows? You could be out there in cyberspace and not even know it. Then again, some of your relatives could. I know at least two of my relatives, and possibly more that I don't even know about, are on the internet. So, you never know. Maybe you should check it out too. So that's his dream, his cause. Before he's through, he intends to stand the ground of Thomas Dewey. That is, uh, of course, the ever amusing Calvin Trillin on <coughs> Bill Clinton. Thomas Dewey. Just let me say that about this. Thomas Dewey tried to put the shaft to me in, in 1952 when I was running for vice president with Ike and, uh, yeah, he, he said, get off the ticket for the good of the party. And uh, I never forgave Thomas Dewey for that. And, and, you know, as much as Harry Truman used to criticize me and say that uh, I was nothing more than a liar, uh, I, I, I can't say I'm unhappy that, that Thomas Dewey lost to Harry Truman back in 1948. So we would have had Bill Clinton in 1948, right? In this Thomas Dewey-Bill Clinton parallel. And... Uh, Boy, wouldn't that have been something? If I had the time, you know. See, the thing is, the presidents, right? You could switch them all around and do a big what if. Like, a stitch in time. What if Bill Clinton were the first president and George Washington were the 40th president? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, King George III, I feel your pain, and I will not let our troops fire upon innocent redcoats and hessians as long as I am the leader of this Continental Congress. And of course, George Washington, where's my slaves? <laughs> Say, I like these new ventures here. Where are they made of? Yeah. Pretty good. I can eat an apple. And so he spent his time eating apples all day instead of running the country to test the efficacy of his new dentures. <coughs> well, Mr. Washington, you clearly you don't understand foreign policy. Foreign policy? The United States should have no foreign policy. Our policy should stop at American shores. We must beware of foreign entanglements. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Washington, that was all very well and good in the colonial era, but uh, uh, America is a world power now. Oh, yes, and Britain was a world power, too. And look what happened to them. A sobering thought, eh? So that would mean instead of having Ronald Reagan, we would have had Thomas Jefferson, which is fitting and appropriate in a way because the Republicans have put up this congressional web link called Thomas. You can access it at http.thomas.com Oh geez, I don't know. Dot, I know it ends with G-O-V. So, you can get to it that way. And it's cool, man. Oh, it's probably .org or .gov or something. 
type in Thomas and see what happens. Anyway, um, back to the drug war. On its front lines, the drug war is sowing the seeds of its own opposition, say Ava Bertram and Ken Sharp in the article War Ends, Drugs Win, in the Nation of January 6, 1997. Yes, kids, we are finally in 1997. This marks the Great Divide. Of course, I am speaking to you from the perspective of July 8th, and what I have to keep in mind is just how much more world events will have transpired by the time I reach the point uh, in time where I'm at now. Probably enough to carry us through the entirety of 1997, even though there may not be that much in the political, uh, you know, it might, not, it might not be that much political news to speak of in 97. I mean, so far it hasn't really been a very eventful year. Several significant Supreme Court decisions, although none as significant as 1994's Adirond Constructors, or uh, was that 95? I think it was 95, actually, um, have come down, one regulating the internet, or actually failing to do so, and um, one speaking of no constitutional right to a uh, right to die. Oh, and uh, the president is not immune from lawsuits. That's a hot one. Well, anyhow, we'll get to those in several months. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the drug war, yes, and its extension of the military-industrial complex and the Cold War. I mean, isn't it perfectly obvious to everybody that this drug war is just a means of waging war upon deviance of another stripe altogether? But instead of being economic deviance, they're chemical deviance. Can you imagine such a thing? What an abomination. Could the founding fathers have possibly anticipated such a thing as chemical deviance? Who no less are hounded? Hounded, I say. So. I guess I'd better uh, get a move on here. If we are not willing to become our brother's keepers, then we must become our brother's jailers, says U.S. District Judge Robert Sweet. So basically the drug war is a race war against people who in an economic war. It's like we've internalized the struggle against communism and displaced it upwards or downwards, as the case may be, upon the populace of our own country, the urban poor, predominantly black, Once we make drug addicts into the enemy, society has a rough time taking them back in. Why would the public want to pay for more treatment if they're dealing with the enemy? It's like, you know, you can come to accommodations with communists, but you ever, can't ever turn your back on them. You can, you can treat addicts, but you know, you can never really trust them because uh, eventually they're going to backslide, right? The mugwump William Cohen has a reputation for independence, but he's arm in arm with the Pentagon, a staunch supporter of the weapons establishment. Oh, yes. In any event, let's talk a little bit about Abby Hoffman. He was in the news back in January. We're not only talking about history, we're talking about broader cultural trends, of course. Like the love of cats. When did this whole cats mania erupt? 
I mean, it was dogs, dogs, dogs for so many years. Lad, a dog. I mean, I could give you examples, right? Okay. Lad, a dog by Albert Payson Pear Hume. Copyright 1919. See, 1919 was truly the year of the dog. There are two things of which the best type of thoroughbred collie is abjectly afraid. One is a mad dog. The other, a poisonous snake. And when Lad spotted the copperhead not three feet away from him, with only Baby's fragile body as a barrier between, he was tremulously, quakingly, sickly afraid. Then the child's gaze fell on the snake, and Baby shrank back against Lad. The motion jerked the rug's fringe, disturbing the copperhead. The snake coiled and drew back its three-cornered head. The child caught up a picture book and flung it at the serpent. Back went the triangular head, and then it flashed forward, striking for the child's thin knee. Then Baby was knocked flat by a mighty and hairy shape that lunged across her, toward her foe, and the deadly copperhead's fangs sank deep in Lad's nose. I mean, <laughs> how, how, how much more stirring do you want something to be without having a heart attack? I mean, how, can you imagine this with a cat as the protagonist? <coughs> we'll try this. There are 500,000 things of which the worst type of thoroughly undomesticated feline alley cat is abjectly afraid. And, of course, the list is far too long to enumerate. And so, when Footsie spotted the copperhead not three feet away from him, with only Baby's fragile body as a barrier between, he was out of there in a flash. The snake bit the kid. The cat was nowhere to be found, and that's the end. <laughs> See? So, there's the difference between the cat people and the dog people. See, the dog people, if you said dogs are cowardly, well, they would acknowledge that as part of a dog's makeup. But when you say that to the cat people, they know they can't argue with it. Although they always try to make excuses, you know. Oh, well, cats are far too intelligent to put themselves into danger in a foolhardy way. If there's a foolhardy degree to which the canine is accustomed. This is driving me mad. This, the theme from uh, the Scott Joplin tune, The Entertainer, also the theme to The Sting. It's now become the uh, official theme for ice cream trucks in the area. So all summer long. Oh, what's this? Huh. My picture, torn in half. Oh, nice. I'll be right back. I know I'm sort of like uh, rambling all over the uh, all over the map here. I'm going to try to be focused now. Talk a little bit about uh, Abby Hoffman. You know, Abby Hoffman was really the popularizer of a lot of ideas that other people had. Genuine anarchists like Emmett Grogan. The revolution pressed on Abby Hoffman's heart and he put his manic depression where it belonged, on the line for the glory of a liberated life, says Jonah Raskin. Emmett Grogan, June 1967, SDS Conference, Michigan. Faggots, you haven't got the balls to go mad. You're going to make a revolution? You'll piss in your pants when the violence erupts. Abby Hoffman. I saw myself as a son of liberty, riding through the night, sounding the alarm. Abby thrived on the enigmatic and elusive and was constantly reinventing himself, says Jonah Raskin. <coughs> A modern revolutionary group is headed for the television station, not the factory, says Abby Hoffman, master of the obvious. Abby called on his generation to become life actors, said he. 
Punk nuns. Laugh at professors. Disobey your parents. Burn your money. Turn your life into an art form. A theater of the soul and a theater of the future. And indeed, burning money is uh, one of the very best ways to get attention on stage. On the eve of the march on the Pentagon, he wrote, we will fuck on the grass and beat ourselves against the doors. We will dye the Potomac red, burn the cherry trees, panhandle diplomats. <coughs> oh, excuse me. School children will will open up, will empty out their desks and throw ink at stunned instructors. Office secretaries will disrobe and run into the streets. Newsboys will rip up their newspapers and sit on the curbstones masturbating. Storekeepers will throw open their doors, making everything free. Accountants will all collapse in one mighty heart attack. Soldiers will throw down their guns. That was, of course, Abby Hoffman. Hoffman himself was all resistance. This was his strength and his tragic limitation. When the turmoil subsided, he was lost. And as a matter of fact, Ken Kesey pointed out to the uh, people who were marching on the Pentagon that in many respects they were no better than the Pentagon themselves. They both symbolized the same thing. And uh, Abby Hoffman was very much like the military industrial complex which he found himself on the losing side of. Once there was no war, he was floundering all at sea. So, Prozac, if only Abby had had some Prozac, huh? Prozac is the second best-selling drug in the world. Gee, what is this war on drugs? It's like the bad drugs, the good drugs. The good drugs are medicine, the bad drugs are drugs. I don't get it. I just don't understand. A bad drug can be a good drug if a doctor says it's okay to use it. So, it's sort of like medieval alchemy. If you wave some sort of magic wand, you can transmute baser metals into gold and drugs, dangerous drugs, into beneficial and beneficent, all-powerful medicines. If Prozac were a street drug, God help us all. Perhaps someday it will be, when new and more effective therapeutic tools of psychiatric intervention are discovered, much the same way that quaaludes became more or less contraband, um, so will Prozac. And all these Prozac addicts who've got a yen for that substance in particular and no other will be uh, forced to find their illicit drug on the streets. Anglo-American law was profoundly shaped by the sporadic insanity of King George III. Wow. Where in the hell did that come from? Oh yeah, witchcraft. Neil Johnston. The nation for January 6, 1997 is fascinating. It's not, you know, sometimes it's just like skim through it in 20 minutes and have done with it. Other times, however, you know, it's got hours and hours of reading. The Greco-Roman madman was the concern of the clan. Infants and certainly certain readily recognized wild men or furiosi lived in an irresponsible world beyond the concern of criminal law. In the Middle Ages, early Christianity, seeing each individual as a divine creation, could scarcely fail to see in each man's madness not a divine gift, but a divine judgment. Insanity, far from providing any sort of excuse, became additional evidence of guilt. In the West, madness was increasingly perceived as a sister of heresy. Insanity, or at least any manifestations of it, seen as seen as touching in any way on magic became 
Unlike most crimes, witchcraft occurred inside the mind of the criminal, uh, just like drugs. The church evolved its experts, knowing in the arts of penetrating the dark recesses of the human mind. In an ironic sense, the modern forensic expert psychiatrist witness emerges from the insane but logical world of the 15th century Dominican fathers who wrote the first horn book on witchcraft trials, the Malleus Maleficarum. And this is where it leads to Anglo-American law was profoundly shaped by the sporadic insanity of King George III. An expert opinion can be found pointing in any direction. The insanity defense, finally, has less to do with criminal law than with the fact that all of us, no less than our ancestors, resonate sympathetically to the notion of a god or a devil embodied in our midst. The terrifying fragility of our culture and the omnipresent nearness of the wild beasts and idle humors cited by Neil Johnston, Daniel and Robinson. Well, anyhow, Yarn, yarn, yarn. <coughs> there really are worse things than being offended, says Nigella Lawson. The true thing about a truism is that it's true, says Martin Amos. And let me paraphrase him. Boston is overrun with people who find fault with it for not being enough like the place from which they once wanted to escape. How do you like that, huh? If your idea of civilization runs to pedestrianized precincts, a sock shop at every corner, and not much noise after 11.30 at night, then please stay in Birmingham, Alabama, or... Waukegan, Illinois, and don't go bothering us with your twitchy parochialism. Well, anyway. Brezhnev and Kasigan, Russian premier. Perhaps they were, in fact, the same person. I mean, were they ever in the same room at the same time? Actually, yes, but it wasn't a room anyone else cared to be in. A very witty turn of phrase. Yes, indeed. Well, oh yeah, the election results. I forgot to tell you. Ralph Nader got 480,000 votes. How do you like that? Just a little under half a million in an election where, geez, I don't know. How many people actually voted in that election? 80 million, something like that? I don't know. Uh, 50 million? Uh, we know that 50% of the voting public actually bothered to vote. 50% of the registered voters, and of course not everybody registers to vote. I was one of those 480 million. In Oregon, he got 4%. In Portland, Oregon, he got 8.1%. In some California cities, he got 10%. That, of course, presumes that he was on the ballot. In Massachusetts, he was not on the ballot. How do you like that, huh? Everyone knows that the way money is raised in Washington is corrupting especially the part that's legal. Well, moving right along. The left wing of politics has its rages as much as the right, says 
says Michael Bywater. The left has its rages as much as the right, but its anger is driven by a sense of thwarted decency rather than greed. In short, the left tries to be nice. I exclude from this general niceness the vicious yellow-toothed slipperiness of politicians. They are, with very few exceptions, a body of people so far removed from the normal thoughts and feelings of everyday humanity as to make their claims to represent us ridiculous. The natural instinct of every decent human being on meeting a politician is to wipe the phony smirk off the bastard's face, and that's how it should be. Political correctness is nothing more than good manners run riot. It says we are allowed to draw attention to our own shortcomings, but not other people's. It still secretly marks shortcomings, and our laughter has to be guarded. But jokes, I mean, I don't mean wit, and I don't mean that strange, arch, rather wishy-washy thing called humor. Jokes cannot be guarded. If a joke allows the listener to control his response to laugh, it fails, as pointless as a polite orgasm. The right, which is to say the right wing, is a philosophy of solipsism, of greed, of social Darwinism, of hierarchy, and of constant struggle. The right can make jokes about whoever it damn well likes, and the victims of its jokes should simply regard themselves as lucky not to have been shot, privatized, or simply eaten. The right sees the world as man against man, tribe against tribe, strong against weak. Its language is that of the pack bond in warfare. Its favorite institutions are lean, mean, muscular, gung-ho, ruthless, disciplined, hard-nosed. Its disciplines present themselves as valiant, beleaguered bands of warriors. I'm sorry, its disciples present themselves as valiant, beleaguered bands of warriors under constant threat from the forces of anarchy, wetness, and disarray. Visit any after-work salesman's bar, any business conference, any conference of half-pissed corporate fucks in nasty suits and those special shirts they wear, described by the makers as crisp, and you enter a war zone of hypertensive, shouty, joke-struggling, of, of hypertensive, shouty, joke-struggling, the carpet wet with hormones, the badlands beyond the huddle alive with horrors, dykes, muggers, faggots, coons, mix, frigid bitches, spastics, this blind bloke see, this packy see, this cripple, this feminist, this Jew, this tart, this bloke who can't get it up. So, anyway, Michael Bywater. His opinions, of course, necessarily represent my own. Yes, the right wing has all the good jokes. The jokes are a way of briefly acknowledging and sharing the fear of the unknown, the other, the deep inadequacy. Ben Elton's stand-up shows weren't really about jokes, but a chance, about a chance to see a passionate and articulate man announcing what was on his mind without dissembling. Elton's Rowan Atkinson character could have walked on set from an old seaside postcard. Ineffectual, sexually torrid, pompous, a buffoon and a gull, he may appear to be an example of fine left humor, the butt of anti-establishment, anti-authority satire, but really he is still just dad, hubby, the hen-pecked fool who can't get it up, in short a man, his terrible CID man, vicious, stupid, doomed to humiliating failure, drowning in fruitless testosterone, the bugger deserves all he gets. Inappropriate is a word you seldom hear from the right. The left's benignity has left them so nervous, so prickly, and so easily offended that they end up as sensitive and as restricted in their own thoughts and responses as any nonconformist lay preacher. Life-denying, censorious, prim, twee, genteel, utterly buttoned up, somehow niceness seems to drive out joy as well as cruelty. 
and you end up with lists of things you can't talk about, things you can't make jokes about, things you can't even think about, which, of course, is death to jokes, which rely on exposing, celebrating, and temporarily at least in the explosion of laughter, relieving our atavistic fears and our conditioned prejudices. Without bigotry, there would be no jokes. In a climate of terrified relativism, <coughs> There's no possibility of making good jokes. Precious little chance of even calling things by their right names. The best you can even hope for is to try and make them laugh. Oh, my friend. <coughs> Sad but true. How are our pretty, pretty kitty cats doing? A uh, little footsie. Pretty kitty. Lap up that life-giving milk. You know, I don't feed my cat animal products. My cat's a vegetarian. And when he wants a little snack, he just sucks the breath right out of baby. Now, after kitty's been sucking the breath out of baby, he gets hungry. So I dangle a little catnip mouse over the crib. Just in case Kitty wants a snack after all that hard work. See, Kitty's not actually eating meat here. He's eating soy protein products. The, the fact that it gets all crispy and grungy around the edges is, in fact, not a reflection on the quality of the soy products which Kitty is eating so avidly and voraciously. Now, see, now there's an example of improv. I don't have that on the teleprompter. You can rest assured. What the hell does that mean anyway, rest assured? Uh, well, here's something interesting. Uh, eclecticism is the norm. Hey, think about that one, Daddy-O. All those beatniks, all the beatnik figures. You know, the beatnik it really sort of uh, exploded across the relatively sedate 1950s, what with all their red baiting and red hunting and uh, House on American Activities Committee and uh, Korean War and Sputnik and all that other stuff. I mean, the 50s weren't really that sedate an era, contrary to popular belief or misbelief. Um, but the beatnik was sort of like uh, the big craze of the 1950s. And like any such craze, and this was back when the information explosion hadn't quite reached the degree that it has reached uh, to date. Every, oh, I don't know, every, uh, every 10 years or so, there erupts a, a sort of a, a bookmarked deviant figure who crops up in all sorts of strange and unfamiliar contexts due to the popularity of the concept. And one of these was the Beatnik. Of course, the stereotypical hippie of the 1960s was another, and the gold chain wearing Coke spoon sporting disco fanatic of the 1970s was yet another, and the greedy shark skin suit wearing alligator shoes sporting alligator skin wallet totem me generation yuppie greed master was the 80s equivalent whereas uh, in the 90s I guess the closest thing we have is the grunge aficionado or perhaps the the, uh, the rap music uh, type of person I mean you know the thing is that in the 50s it started it, it was the last time that there was one deviant figure who was mainstream enough to have influence over genres more or less unrelated to his or her everyday activities. The hippie, you know, the hippie figure it could be a force of humor or it could be a force of uh, social commentary. 
But then things got more nebulous in the in the seventies, and there wasn't any one stereotypical scapegoat type figure. But the beatnik was the big nineteen fifties and early nineteen sixties sensation. And uh, I'm digressing here, but uh, what better, you know, beatnik? I mean, it's someone who's deviant, uh, vaguely communistic associations because of the phrase Nick. Sputnik, Beatnik, um, and of course Beat in general, and all those Kerouac aficionados, you can really tell the strength of one of these scapegoated figures by the degree to which they are still revered and honored 30 or 40 years down the road by people who are too young to actually have experienced the actual phenomenon. Now, the Gibson girl of the 19 teens isn't really much spoken of except among 80 year olds and the flapper isn't really uh, very much uh, adhered to as a uh, topic of interest. Uh, I think Bonnie and Clyde of 1967 or thereabouts was the last real portrayal of the flapper with the possible exception of fried green tomatoes but you know that was uh, kind of an, uh, an anachronistic aberration, a period piece more than a craze, um, having found its second wind. Um, so, and, and you know, Paper Moon in the 1970s, it sort of brought the Depression era waif back into brief public focus, but there was no real secondary, uh, what, do you might, what you might call a secondary flashback effect um, until the beatnik. See, the beatnik is a figure of nostalgia, and there are still people who are adherents of Jack Kerouac who were sat greatly saddened by, saddened by the death of Allen Ginsberg. The beatnik sort of occupies a rather strange uh, sort of uh, a, um, position because. Uh, they, they, they really thoroughly imbued popular culture. Um, Maynard G. Krebs, as portrayed by John Denver in The Many Loves of Goby Gillis. Um, there were any number of reefer madness type beatnik movies. Television shows had beatnik and later juvenile delinquent windbreaker hood type characters throughout the early, the late 50s and up to the late 60s. Um, even sad sack comics had a beatnik type character called Hi-Fi Tweeter. And that was the whole reason for this lengthy digression, to fit that not entirely interesting fact into the uh, mix. See, the, the closest equivalent to the beatnik in more contemporary times was the punk rocker, but that was almost artificial. It was almost grafted onto our sensibilities um, by the media. It was not so much an organic movement as the beatnik. And the thing with the beatnik is it sort of branched out or brachiated into the hippie. And uh, it's almost like it was a sect of some kind. It was Christianity and the hippie was the Protestant rebellion against the Catholic, the cath, catholo, catholo, you know, the, the Catholicity of the Catholicity of the beatnik. There was a brief beatnik revival in the 70s, as I seem to recall, but it never really went anywhere. And what has really happened is, in recent times, there's this whole lounge subculture as epitomized by the local fanzine Cheeseball, which is basically devoted to dredging up the whole pre-hippie beatnik aesthetic of the late 50s and early 60s. 
<coughs> which I find endlessly fascinating. Now, beatniks tended to be left-leaning, but also, in some respects, were very conservative as well. Uh, look at Jack Kerouac, for example. Um, sure, he smoked a lot of pot, but he was really a big alcoholic, and uh, he didn't have much truck with hippie types. And he was basically a my country right or wrong character when it came right down to it. See, the thing about the beatniks is they were only domestically subversive. They weren't really very much interested in uh, in socialism or communism. They were more hedonistic. In that respect, they were kind of a precursor to the 70s me generation type of hippie. Oh, the endless, endless, endless discussions that could result from this. However, we have to move on. My point, however, is that um, all this stuff about beatniks, you might think it doesn't have an awful lot to do with politics, but it does. Because every political group defines itself at least partially in opposition to a socio-cultural group or movement. The Democrats, the left, the good left-wing Democrats, who are, of course are the radical fringe of their party right now, um, can define themselves against the right-wing militia types like Timothy McVeigh et alia, and uh, the good Republican uh, Christian coalition types can define themselves against the irresponsible hedonism as reflected in our rap music and that other crazy stuff that our young people are up to and always seem to be up to and have always seemed to have been up to since time immemorial, which as Washington Irving observed, in America time immemorial means since the last big financial shakedown. So in his lexicon, that would be about 1987 which of course was the big stock market crash. And of course there's a smaller crash in 89, but let's talk about the 87 crash. Everything before that, really, it's basically ancient history. Especially since uh, computers don't really go back that far when it comes to information sources. About 1985, I mean, some government sources go back to 76, but that's it. You gotta actually go to paper sources if you want real information. So historians won't be put out of business anytime soon, nor will libraries. The internet is basically the perfect symbol of the a a historicity of the average American. Americans are basically defined by their a historicity or lack of a concept of history. And to just that degree, all of this talk, digressing as it does all the way back to 1905, is probably not particularly compelling. Okay, I now must get back to the phrase which caused this lengthy digression. Eclecticism is the norm. So this all this cocktail lounge jazz, uh, it's the norm, right? I mean, it was the norm. It, it, it went vastly out of fashion for many, many years. And now it's back. And like most trends, who was the first person in my acquaintance to have anything to do with these trends? Who was listening to Ornette Coleman and John Coltrane back when Elton John and warmed over 60s hippie music was the norm? Why? Billy Ruane. Who invented slam dancing? Why? And the mosh pit. Billy Ruane. He was doing that back in 1980. Christ, I mean... The pogo, from the pogo to slam dancing wasn't really very much of an evolution. But who was first and foremost on the front lines of the culture wars? Billy Ruane. Who was wearing Chinese slippers back before anybody knew where they were, what they were, or where to get them? Why? Billy Ruane. 
1978. And most importantly, who was listening to this stupid, sleazy cocktail jazz crap and 60s mush pop crap sh dreck? Why, Billy Ruane? Billy Ruane has an enormous collection of this sort of stuff. Much of it probably now in a warehouse somewhere. But uh, anyway, Billy Ruane is the guy to see. If you want to know what the next big major breaking trend is, just watch Billy Ruane. And who invented the poetry slam? Why? It was the wrong hero, an unpublished manuscript in 1978, who invented the poetry slam. However, who invented the phrase yuppie? Why, it was the wrong hero in unpublished correspondence dating from 1980, a full two years before the actual use of the phrase in printed form. But, hey, live and learn. You can't win, really. You don't get credit for anything unless you publicize it. Who invented the joke, vodka corrupts, but absolute vodka corrupts absolutely? The wrong hero. And yet, in the U.S. News and World Report of December 1995, it was cited as the creation of some other bohunk by John Leo, no less. Not fair. I came up with that joke many years before that. But, what can you do? It's the guy who publicizes it. Did Eli Whitney really invent the cotton gin? Did Robert Fulton really invent the steamboat? Did Alex was Alexander Bell the first person to come up with the notion of the telephone? Well, obviously no, but they were the publicizers. Was Darwin's theory really the first theory of evolution? Come on. Some other guy thought of it first. Darwin was the fustest with the mostest. That's the story of inventions. Whoever gets out there and actually copyrights, patents, popularizes, Vladimir Zaworkin. Who remembers him, and yet he invented television? Anyway, let's get back to the main point. Eclecticism is the norm. This according to Cheryl Garrett. Cults can no longer develop because nothing stays underground for long enough. Now, my citation for both of these provocative quotes is from the New Statesman in Society of December 20th, 1996. The tabloids doorstop new names within weeks. In the 80s, we admired stars such as Madonna for their manipulation of the media. Now, we consider it part of their job. Youth is taking over once more. And let us hope that what they really want is more than just a change in the charts. The Darwinist school of cultural criticism, in which past art only seems superior, always seems superior, because all only the strongest survives. <coughs> but not much has changed since 1979. Look at Hollywood movies. In 1979 and in 1996, the genres represented manipulative Hollywood weepy, Kramer vs. Kramer, Mr. Holland's Open, Extraterrestrial Fantasy, Alien, Independence Day, Stylistic Futuristic Dystopia by Young Director, Mad Max, Strange Days, Annual Movie by Woody Allen, Manhattan, Mighty Aphrodite, Self-Indulgent American History Epic by Tricky but Brilliant Director, Apoc Apocalypse Now, Nixon, Movie that British cultural establishment wanted to ban, Life of Brian, Crash, Weird Peace by Cult Foreigner, Nosferatu, Breaking the Waves, Thomas Hardy, Tess of the Durbervilles, Judy Obscure, Robert Altman, Quintet, Kansas City, Low Budget Brit Drama, Brass Dog, Radio On. See, the more things change, the more they stay the same. But, in 1979, there was no equivalent to the kind of mainstream but offbeat 
literate but populist American cinema that was represented at least twice this year by Seven and Fargo. What's the difference between celebrities and politicians? What drives celebrities to share their secrets, and why are politicians so bad at it? That is the question which defines the difference between celebrities and politicians and makes the one a subset of the other. <coughs> politicians are celebrities with secrets to hide. Let's see, let me formulate an aphorism here for you. Uh, celebrities are politicians with no secrets to hide. Um, celebrities are politicians who publicize their secrets. Celebrities are politicians who hang their dirty laundry out to dry. Well, that's kind of dry. Celebrities are politicians who encourage people to take pictures of their dirty laundry. Um, celebrities are politicians with no skeletons in their closets. Um, celebrities are politicians who not only show you the skeletons in their closets, but their family trees. You get the idea. Definitely the most fun part of being a feminist, says Julie Burchill, is frightening men. Publisher Conrad Black says of journalists, ignorant, lazy, opinionated, intellectually dishonest, and inadequately supervised. So. In any event, Martin Amos began a novel entitled Money with the phrase, this is a suicide note. Now, when you have an idea like that, everything else just seems to fall right into place. For example, my brilliant idea of tying together this rambling political uh, Farrago of semi-related thoughts by showing footage of cute little kitties cavorting around in order to render palatable some of the rather strange and strident ideas which have emerged from this so far one hour and a half unendurably lengthy program. You know, of course, that speaking for an hour and a half straight is an almost unendurable feat. And uh, if I had my way, I'd probably do this in 40-minute chunks and be able to finish two of them a week. However, my production schedule does not admit to such desultory. The dog is covering its ears with its paw. It, even the dog is sick of the sound of my voice. What are you doing? I wish I could show you this. This is a lot cuter than any kitty cat cavorting about. But anyway, anyway, yeah. America's new cultural icon is the therapist, not the cowboy. The can-do frontier spirit has been obliterated by a national sense of self-pity. Boy, ain't that the truth. No nation has ever marketed its heroes so assiduously. Hawkeye, Superman, Rawhide, the Wright Brothers, John Glenn, John Wayne, Clint Eastwood, Neil Armstrong. I still marvel at the way Americans live up to their myths, combining imagination, talent, and persistence in the face of conventional wisdom. Well, all very well and good, Gavin Edler, but you haven't mentioned the most important hero of all. The wrong hero. Un-American. Does any other country use its name this way? 
as a compliment or negatively as the worst criticism? Good point. The American hero of the 17th century was a rugged adventurer. Of the 18th century, a pioneer settler or a patriotic anti-British revolutionary. In the 19th century, a cowboy. And in the 20th century, a therapist. A culture of whining. You can get mad and get even at the same time. The 1990s designer victim, the angry white male. In America, says de Tocqueville in 1831, there is so much distinguished talent among the subjects and so little among the heads of government. Well, now we're getting into 1997. They have no diplomacy. You don't need diplomacy if you are so powerful. That was Boutros, Boutros, Boutros Galley on the United States. I will not concede to an inarticulate, flaky, non-qualified person, says Bob Dornan on Ms. Sanchez. You know, of course, about that disputed California election. Nobody's really interested in that. But Louisiana. Congress is mourning Bob Dornan the way a zoo mourns the loss of a rabid squirrel monkey with a scabies chewed butt. Everybody got tired of cleaning up the dim primates mess, said Will Durst. Will Durst is one of the most compelling reasons to read The Progressive. He has a column, which is a wrap up. In Billings, Montana, they have parking meters that give you 12 minutes for a penny that's five hours for a quarter. And no, the town is not seen in black and white, says Will Durst. Los Angeles, in which the entire universe revolves around, frightening when you think of the number of people here whose ultimate goal in life is a washboard stomach. So far, Bob Dornan has blamed his downfall on lesbians, cowardly Republicans, and dead illegal alien felons, and he is expected to release evidence soon that giant space monsters with scaly talons filled the scale skulls of poll workers with jelly donuts. If House members got report cards, his would be marked in bold red sharpie, does not play well with others. Responding to weird metallic inner voices, Mr. Gingrich actually said out loud, We're more than just a cynical, venal, narrow, corrupt profession that all too often is a reflection of the current culture. Of course you are. You're also manipulative, lying, scornful, unscrupulous, swindling, avaricious, grasping, virulent, cheating, fraudulent, and petty. It's interesting though because I was what I was sort of groping towards was a definition of politics as culture. Politics is not really a revenge tragedy. Politics is a revenge farce. The first time, politics is a tragedy. The second time, it's a farce. So let me write that down. So that's sort of, uh, that's kind of convenient, actually. That should come up with two snappy aphorisms in the course of 90 minutes of pretty much uh, free-form babbling. Well, Muriel Rukeyser in 1935 said, where is there a place for poetry? Well, certainly not in politics, that's for sure. I mean, yeah, politics can use some poetry to jazz up their speeches or whatnot, but uh, in 
in any event, let us go then, you and I. Radio shows try to bring, try to bring people down to make you small. America doesn't need small. America needs big, said Bill Clinton on December 15th. Americans think bigness qualifies them to run the world, said Lexington in The Economist for December 21st. In America, if there is no forest, the desert will do. What a monster of a government, what a monster of a government is that where the noblest faculties of the mind and the whole heart are not represented. A semi-human tiger or ox stalking over the earth with its heart taken out and the top of its brain shot away, says Thoreau. Must the citizen, even for a moment or in the least degree, resign his conscience to the legislator? Why is every man a conscience then? Is it not desirable to cultivate a respect for the law so much as for the right? It is not desirable to cultivate a respect for the law so much as for the right. Again, the row. Kill the rough populist beast on which the court, the courthouse sits, and sooner or later the courthouse too may disappear. It's difficult to cite a name for that particular quote since The Economist does not have journalists who have names. Well. Now we're getting into in Copenhagen. This is a you know Spiro Agnew died at the end of 1996. Former vice president, remember him? In Copenhagen, a bearded hippie walked up to him and declared, "You're Spiro Agnew." "Yes, I am," was his reply. Lay some rhetoric on me, man. According to George W. Bailey, cited in McLean's, the Canadian News Weekly, of December 30th, the right does, while the left complains. Now here's something you didn't know. The most popular pizza toppings in the United Kingdom are tuna and corn. Yeah. Degree of talent is no measure of rights, says Jefferson. So next time your uh, militia pals start preaching on and on about old long Tom Jefferson, just stick that in your crawl. That'll shut them up right quick. Right quick now. Ross Perot is a, it's very fortunate we have a figure like Ross Perot. He is so infinitely parodyable. Oh wow. It's sort of like playing with an electronic mouse. What a relief. It would be rather distasteful to actually watch a real mouse being caught and eaten by a cat. But as long as it's merely a mechanical facsimile, much like many of our Hollywood movies, then murder is okay. Right? Right. Okay, so. Painfully often, the legislation our politicians pass is designed less to solve problems than to protect the politicians from defeat in our never-ending election campaigns. They are, in short, too frightened of us to govern, said Anthony King in The Atlantic of January 1997. 
I will quote at further length. To an extent that astonishes a foreigner, modern America is about the holding of elections. Politics and government in the United States are markedly are, are marked by the fact that the United States elected officials in many cases have very short terms of office and face the prospect of being defeated in primary elections and have to run for office more as individuals than as standard bearers for their party and have continuously to raise large sums of money in order to finance their own election campaigns. There is no other country in the world in which all of these factors operate and operate simultaneously. Words masquerade as deeds, actions not instrumental but rhetorical. Symbolic politics. A problem exists. The people demand that it be solved. Politicians cannot solve it and know so. They engage in an elaborate pretense of trying to solve it nevertheless, often at great expense to the taxpayers and almost invariably at a high cost in terms of both the truth and the politicians own reputations for integrity and effectiveness. The politicians lie in most cases not because they are liars or approve of lying, but because the potential electoral costs of not lying are too great. At one extreme, symbolic politics consists of speech making and public position taking in the absence of any real action or intention of taking action. Casting the right vote is more important than achieving the right outcome. Voters are afraid of criminals and politicians are afraid of voters. Voters routinely punish lawmakers who try to do unpopular things who challenge them to face unpleasant truths about the budget, crime, social security, or tax policy. Similarly, voters reward politicians for giving them what they want, more spending for popular programs, even if it means wounding the nation in the long run by creating more debt. America's problem of governance is not insufficient responsiveness, but hyper-responsiveness on the part of its elected leaders. Interest groups are particularly powerful because America's elected politicians are peculiarly vulnerable. The more they call for democracy, the more they get. The more they get, the more dissatisfied. The more they become dissatisfied, the more they call for more democracy. The cycle endlessly repeats itself. The term limits movement is of a piece with previous outbursts of frustrated American populism, including the Know Nothing movement of the 1850s. An essay, as one historian has put it, in The Politics of Impatience. <coughs> it is becoming harder and harder to take career breaks in politics. Those who jump off the ladder in any profession find it increasingly hard to jump back even to the level they were on when they left, let alone to the level they would have attained had they stayed. For this reason, it is hard to imagine that many upwardly mobile corporate executives or successful professionals or small business owners would take time off to serve in Congress on a citizen legislator basis. The citizens who sought to serve on this basis would probably be largely the rich and the old. Bismarck is reputed to have said that there are two things one should never watch being made, sausages and laws. Both should be judged more by the end result than by the precise circumstances of their manufacture. Well, that was a, a very interesting mini seminar on the problems which face our polity. Get them by the archetypes and their hearts and minds will follow, says Jack Sorensen.
He's talking, of course, of Star Wars, but he could jolly bloody well be talking about politics. In almost everything you do, you teach, whether you are aware of it or not. Some people aren't aware of what they are teaching. They should be wiser. Everybody teaches all the time, says, guess who? George Lucas. Your power comes from the fact that you are the creator. Who said that? Why? George Lucas. If I became a Democrat, I'd always be in the position of holding the party back, whereas if I stayed a Republican, I'd be pushing the party forward. Rockefeller. Rockefeller changed almost nothing beyond the draft, the debt ledgers of New York, says Andrew Ferguson. All mouth and no gonads. Florence King on the GOP. Well, another fine journal, one of the many environmental journals which I take in on a monthly basis, The Ecologist e-magazine, um, Ecology, and uh, World Watch. In World Watch it says, in an article quoted, quoting Jim Perry, as the flow of information gets bigger and more complex, reporters can be tempted just to pick out those bits and pieces that make the juiciest stories, much the same way as I'm doing right now. But the difference between me and a reporter is a reporter actually organizes his material, whereas this has been an exceedingly disorganized presentation. However, the digressions are an intrinsic part of the presentation. Well, I believe I am almost through toying with you. As much as I would like to continue for another two hours, I fear I must leave you soon. as it is, I will barely have the time to return the dog, take the dog back home. Want to go home? Want to go home? You want to go home? Well, 15 minutes. Like a dog can understand the notion of 15 minutes. Like a dog knows when it's his birthday and begins sulking because nobody is paying any attention. Well, only a fool allows an ant to sting him twice, says Aaron Sachs. A burnt child shuns the fire. Poverty means God forgives our thefts, says a 10-year-old homeless street urchin in Angola. Suppressing the reality of poverty is the strongest shield of the privileged against change. Chiapas, Papua New Guinea, Brazil, India, Indonesia, Rwanda, Nigeria, China, Bolivia, British Columbia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, El Salvador, Ethiopia, Haiti, Honduras, Myanmar, Nicaragua, Niger, Peru, Philippines, Senegal, Somalia, Sudan, Suriname, Thailand, Venezuela, Zaire, 
all hot spots of poverty, misery, degradation, and shame and fear. Nigeria, a Rwanda with 15 times the population. Chiapas, troubled by refugee influx from other parts of Mexico and Guatemalans. But suppressing the reality of poverty, if only by ignoring it, refusing to concede its existence, or conceding its existence but refusing to discuss it in any way, is the strongest shield of the privileged, and that would include our media, against change. Falsehood is invariably the child of fear, says Alistair Crowley. The sage warns the heads of parties against believing their own lies, says John Arbuthnot in The Art of Political Lying. All sins tend to be addictive, and the terminal point of addiction is what is called damnation, says Auden in Hell. You can fool too many people too much of the time, says James Thurber. The political arena leaves no one alternative. One must eat. Emma Goldman, 1910. Ultimately, a hero is a man who would argue with the gods, and so awakens devils to contest his vision. Norman Mailer, The Presidential Papers. He entered the territory of lies without a passport for return. Graham Greene in The Heart of the Matter. We might make a public moan in the newspapers about the decay of conscience, but in private conversation, no matter what crimes a man may have committed or how cynically he may have debased his talent or his friend, I did it for the money, satisfy all but the most tiresome objections. Lewis Lapham, 1988. The engineering of consent is the very essence of the democratic process, the freedom to persuade and suggest, says Bernays. Robert J. Lifton in The Nazi Doctors. An important part of bureaucratic function is its sealing off of perpetrators from outside influences so that intra-bureaucratic concerns become the entire universe of discourse. What can result has been termed groupthink, a process by which bureaucracies can make decisions that are disastrous for all concerned and when viewed retrospectively, wildly inappropriate and irrational. There is a powerful impulse, both from without and within, to create absolute barriers of thought and feeling between itself and the outside world. Only then can this strange assumption of virtue within the group be maintained. Sounds an awful lot like Washington, D.C. to me, and like that, like that narcissistic personality disorder that we were discussing at the beginning of our presentation. Well, all of these citations were taken from the book Smokescreen by Philip J. Holtz, which I highly recommend. It's a history of the drug wars. And, you know, the theme of this uh, particular presentation has sort of wandered from a, a sort of recognition of cultural differentiation to the military-industrial complex, to the drug wars, and other bait noirs of the wrong hero. But I haven't had much time to devote, of course, to economic globalization, and yet another one of my pet peeves. 
However, in the nation of January 13, 1997, Scott Milva states, In popular mythology, economic globalization is a natural phenomenon like continental drift, impossible to resist or control. In reality, globalization is being shaped and advanced by carefully embodied in a series of international agreements. So, we gained the world and lost our immortal souls. We won the Cold War, but we gave it all away in the Cold Peace. And that is the third aphorism. We won the Cold War, and now we're giving it all away in the cold peace. Nope, nobody does it like the wrong hero. Nobody. I got a million of them. Do you think hydrogen ought to be allowed to come here and put oxygen out of work? Katha Pollock. Well, <coughs> let us uh, more or less conclude with a quote from Christopher Hitchens who is, of course, quite adept at putting a mirror onto the world. I absolutely abominate everything about this season of the year. The newspapers are full of an identical theme. The television and radio pump relentlessly on the same handle. In shops and in public squares, and even in bars and restaurants, the music and the slogans and the propaganda are inescapable. The schools teach even less than usual and begin to rehearse dismal chants under the guidance of wan instructors. Workplaces are given over to paroxysms of repetitive celebration, and it's not just that attendance and observance are compulsory and conscript conscripted, it's that enthusiasm is compulsory too. You can't just conform and get by. You're always being urged to join in. Of what does this remind me? Of the leader's birthday and some god-awful one-party banana republic or people's democracy, that's what. The moral blackmail is silkily offered in the name of the children. Of course he's talking about Christmas. The rest of the year I'm not equally misanthropic, but then for the remains of the year, I don't need the gruesome pretext of an official non-event in order to pour drinks for Fred or buy improving books for my descendants. If one judges slowly, solely by the trickle of images that are the new capitalism substitute for social life, the lifestyle left appears everywhere triumphant. The new corporate culture also invests considerable energy in delineating the flaws and mendacities of corporate culture in whipping up outrage against itself. Call this cynical, dystopic strain liberation marketing. It's the commercials that sidle up and acknowledge that, just between you and the copywriter, advertising is a pack of lies, that bosses are bastards, that the workplace is a site of merciless exploitation and shameless groveling, that most other people are suckers, that life is harsh, or that it's gotten a little crazy, that image is nothing. At its extremes, liberation marketing sees the world as a place of outright commercial brainwashing and tyrannical conformity. Liberation marketing wrings its hands over the massification of American life, over the fact that Americans don't know anything about coffee, that they fall for any number of preposterous 
Madison Avenue invented trends, that they drink bland, mass-produced beer, that mainstream music is palate dribble. Liberation marketing offers to whisk you back to the hard but honest existence enjoyed by primitive peoples or by various rebel celebrities of the past. Liberation marketing imagines an enchanted world populated by subversive sprites. It is your ally, at least in spirit, as you seek freedom from the soul-crushing routine of office and commute. By erecting its own fantasy left, it has offered the world a way to do without the troublesome historical left altogether. The liberatory corporate culture, hymned by liberation marketing, provides a colorful counterpoint to its own high style. It deflates its own flatulent myths. It acknowledges and even fosters discontent with itself, and it brings the discontented warmly into the fold. Now the world corporate order becomes complete, comes complete with its own opposition, a brave brigade of lifestyle pioneers and corporate insurgents. The marketplace nonchalantly permits you to choose signifiers declaring you have faith in the corporate order or you're a non-believer. It simultaneously acts out the roles of vast arrogant power and wily youthful opposition. This, of course, is a quote by Thomas Frank. In a very, very prescient article, which is about as good a way to conclude this presentation as any. And so, tune in next week when The Wrong Hero will bring you part 11 of this massive, lengthy political project. This has been Cafe Cabaret, and this has been The Wrong Hero, and the title of this presentation has been Revenge Farce. Now, if there's enough time, maybe, just maybe, I can find out the name of the next one. Yeah. Tune in next week when The Wrong Hero presents Misguided. I don't know if that's such a good idea, but um, we're coming up to 148 Wrong Hero presentations. Exclusive. That means over 300 hours of Wrong Hero footage. So congratulate me on that great epoch, if you will. And tune in next week, Tuesday night, 9 p.m., channel 55. Floppy watches it every week. <laughs>